Welcome to Microbiology Lecture 9. This is going to correspond to the Bauman Chapter 9 and to Torah Chapter 10, depending on which textbook you're using. We're going to be looking at microbial control. We're going to look at physical and chemical means of controlling microbes outside of the body. We have a separate chapter where we'll look at controlling microbes inside the body. Some basic terminology to get started here. Steriliz sterilization refers to removal of all microbes. This is going to include viruses and endospores, but it does not apply to prions. Prions have been very challenging to be able to eliminate. When we talk about the commercial sterilization of canned food, this is going to indicate only eliminating harmful pathogens. There will still be some innocuous microbes that may exist, so it's not truly sterile. A sterilant is just a sterilizing agent. The term sepsis means having bacterial contamination or septic, so if you think about a septic tank, it's full of bacteria. Aseptic is going to be an environment that's free of contamination by pathogens. Does it mean free of all bacteria, just pathogens? So when we disinfect something, use a disinfectant or disinfection, you're using a physical or chemical agent to inhibit or destroy the microbes. With antisepsis or an antiseptic, this is a chemical that's used on the skin for disinfection. It's the actual process of applying the disinfectant. With degerming, you remove microbes from the surface by scrubbing. It's a mechanical removal. So this is what happens with hand washing. Soap is there to assist. It does not actually destroy the microbes. It just helps them come off the skin easier. Sanitation is used for places. It's a process of disinfecting places or utensils that are used by the public. It helps to decrease the microbes that are on there to meet a public health standard. Pasteurization, this is when you heat something up to kill the pathogens. It helps to decrease the amount of microbes that are there causing food spoilage. And there are different types of pasteurization that can occur. With stasis or static, these are going to be compounds that are going to inhibit growth or metabolism. They don't necessarily kill. So if you use an agent that is going to be bacteriostatic, once it's removed, you may actually have growth of the organism's return. Something that is a site or cytal destroys and permanently inactivates the microbe. So a bactericide or germicide will actually kill the microbe. So microbial death or the microbial death rate, this is the loss of the ability to reproduce under ideal environmental conditions permanently. If you're looking at the rate, it's a constant over time for any particular organism under those particular conditions. We have two main ways that antimicrobials are going to work. One way is to alter the cell walls. The cell walls are important to counteract osmosis when a, in a hypotonic solution, so without a cell wall, it will burst. Damage to the cytoplasmic membrane then allows the contents to leak and the cell dies. If you damage proteins or nucleic acids, you'll end up impairing the cell's function. Proteins are used for regulatory functions in the cell. Denatured proteins don't function and the cell dies. If you alter or destroy nucleic acid, you'll have fatal mutations and the cell will die. There are several factors that affect the efficacy of a sterilizing or antimicrobial treatment. One is the site treated. So whatever you're using cannot be too harsh or extreme, especially if it's on humans, animals, or fragile objects. Some medical instruments do have to be sterilized because they're going to penetrate the body and thus the body's defenses. In general, more microbes means it's going to take longer to eliminate them. Most disinfectants will work better under warm condition. The presence of organic materials inhibits antimicrobials. So if you have the presence of blood, sputum, feces, this is going to influence the selection of the disinfectant. You may need to actually wash the items first before disinfecting them. In general, higher concentrations and fresher solutions are more effective, but you still have to consider the amount of damage that's done to the human, animal, or object in the process. We have a range of organism susceptibility, from most susceptible to most resistant. Your most susceptible will include the enveloped viruses, 
and then they become more resistant as you move to the gram-positive bacteria, non-enveloped viruses, fungi, gram-negative bacteria, the active stages of the protozoa, cysts of the protozoa, the mycobacteria, and finally the bacterial endospores are the most resistant. We can rate the level of germicides. High-level germicides are used to kill all pathogens, including the endospores. This has to be used for invasive instruments. Intermediate-level germicides will kill fungal spores, protozoan cysts, viruses, and pathogenic bacteria, but not the endospores. This can be used on instruments that are only going to contact mucous membranes, but not the invasive instruments. Low-level germicides, these will kill the vegetative bacteria, fungi, protozoa, some viruses, but these are only suitable for items that only contact the skin. The environment will definitely have an influence. Temperature and pH will affect the disinfectants. They tend to work better when they're warmer rather than cool. Some are more effective at lower pHs. Other materials can interfere with disinfection, so you may need to clean the objects first. For example, with the autoclave, you do have to clean off things. If you put in things in dirty in the autoclave, where the steam can't actually contact the surface of the objects, it will not become sterile. So a lot of times they go through a commercial dishwasher first. The biosafety levels were established by the CDC to help create safety in labs that deal with pathogens. Biosafety level 1 is suitable for microbes not known to cause human disease. These have minimal precautions. Hand washing with antibacterial soap and disinfecting the surfaces is used. Biosafety level 2 is designed for moderately hazardous pathogens. These are things like hepatitis, influenza, MRSA. Access to the area is limited while people are working. Extreme precautions are used with sharps and then procedures that cause aerosols. Most of what you use in a learning lab are going to be biosafety level 1 and 2. With biosafety level 3, all the manipulations have to be done in safety cabinets with HEPA filters. The space will have a double entry doors. There'll be negative air pressure and the air leaving the room is HEPA filtered. With the negative air pressure, it keeps the air from leaving the room and going out into the space around it to minimize contamination to the outside region. These are designed for bacteria such as TB, anthrax, yellow fever, Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Biosafety level 4. This is for dangerous and exotic microbes that cause fatal diseases in humans, things like Ebola, smallpox, loss of fever. These generally will be in a separate building or at least completely isolated from other areas. Entry is going to be controlled with electronically sealed airlocks. There will be multiple showers, a vacuum room, a UV light room. Air and water that leave are going to be filtered. Workers will wear personal wear suits that have air hoses. The suits and the labs are pressurized to sweep the microbes away from the workers. We have a few ways of evaluating the disinfectants and antiseptics. One is the phenol coefficient. This compares the ability to control the microbes to phenol under standardized conditions. A ratio greater than 1 indicates it's more effective than phenol. A ratio less is going to be less effective than phenol. This is really no longer used. So the greater the ratio, the more effective it was. With used dilution, you're going to use metal cylinders that are dipped into broth cultures and dried at 37 degrees Celsius. Each cylinder is going to be immersed in different dilutions of the disinfectant being evaluated. After 10 minutes, they're removed, rinsed, and dipped in fresh sterile media for 48 hours. The one that is most effective is the one that isn't going to entirely prevent growth at the highest dilution. That's the current standard used. With the disk diffusion or the Kirby-Bauer method, we use this to evaluate antimicrobial agents like antibiotics. A paper disk is soaked with the antimicrobial agent. Then it's placed on a solid medium that's heavily inoculated. We say we have a full lawn of bacteria where the growth is as close to solid as you can get it. So they're incubated overnight, and then we observe for a zone of inhibition around the disk. The larger the zone, the more effective in general, but it may only indicate how easily the substance diffuses in the auger. So we use a standard table for comparison. The in-use tests, here swabs are taken from the actual object before and after the application of a disinfectant, and then inoculated on appropriate media. They're incubated and then examined for growth. 
With the Kelsey Sykes capacity test, this standard has been approved by the European Union. It determines the cap capacity of a chemical to inhibit bacterial growth. With this test, you have a suspension of bacteria that you add to a suitable concentration of a chemical being tested. At predetermined times, you're going to remove the samples and put them into a disinfectant deactivator. Then you incubate the samples for 48 hours. Following that, you'll examine the turbidity of the samples to determine whether or not the bacteria survived the treatment. Looking at the physical control of microbes, one thing we may consider is the DRT or decimal reduction time. This is the time required to destroy 90% of the microbes in a sample. Heat is one means of physically controlling microbes. The TDP or thermal death point is the lowest temperature that kills all cells in a broth in 10 minutes. The TDT or thermal death time is the time to completely sterilize a particular volume at a set temperature. When possible, we use moist heat. This is going to kill by denaturing proteins. Water is a better conductor of heat than air. You can stick your hand in a hot oven, but you can't stick your hand in boiling water. Air at that temperature, you would be able to do that because of how well it conducts. With boiling, this, or with the air, the moist heat, it destroys the cytoplasmic membrane. Boiling is going to kill the vegetative bacteria and fungi, also protozoa, some of the trophozoites, most viruses at sea level, and this will happen within 10 minutes. The endospores, cysts, and some viruses can survive for hours. So boiling does not sterilize things. This is a common misconception people have. So the autoclave, this does sterilize things. This is going to use a pressure chamber to add pressure to the heat, and so it will heat the steam up to 121 degrees Celsius. Boiling only gets to 100 degrees Celsius. And this will go to 15 PSI. This will destroy all the microbes in a small volume in about 10 minutes. Usually we run the autoclave for at least 15 minutes for safety, more time for larger volumes. It does not destroy prions. So with the autoclave, the steam has to contact all the surfaces, so it cannot be sealed in plastic bags, they can't be wrapped up in foil, you can't have contamination sitting on them, you can't have fecal matter, sputum, any of those kinds of things, they do have to be washed first. So pasteurization, this does not kill all organisms. You do have some heat tolerant prokaryotes that can survive, but they don't tend to cause spoilage. The time or temperature varies on the product that you're actually going to be pasteurizing. For milk, it's done at 72, 72 degrees Celsius for 15 seconds for flash pasteurization. Historically, it was done for 30 minutes at 63 degrees Celsius. Ultra-high temperature pasteurization heats milk to at least 135 or 140 degrees Celsius for only one second, and then cools it rapidly. This will kill all the living microbes. This is used in the food industry for things like the small packages of dairy creamer. Some consumers claim it affects the taste, so we don't do that with a whole lot of things. They tend to not sell very well. Dry heat, this is used for things that cannot be exposed to steam. When you're using your test tubes or flask, you can flame the tip of the tube with a flask. Dry heat requires a higher temperature over a longer time. It will denature proteins and oxidize the metabolites. Sometimes things are put in a type of oven. These would use 171 degrees Celsius for an hour or a little bit lower temperature of 160 to 170 degrees Celsius for two hours. Incineration is really your ultimate sterilization. In the lab, you're incinerating things using a Bunsen burner or an electric heat coil until things glow red. These are going to heat up to about 1500 degrees Celsius. Biomedical waste is also going to be incinerated. 
Refrigeration and freezing. This will decrease microbial metabolism, growth, and reproduction. It doesn't necessarily kill things. Your psychrophiles can multiply in the refrigerator and spoil food. So just because you put something in the refrigerator doesn't mean it will last indefinitely. The ice crystals can puncture the cell membrane in a slow freeze. It may kill some things, but it does not kill all microbes. With desiccation, this is when you dry something. This is going to inhibit growth because metabolism requires water. It does not kill all microbes. Some things don't take a whole lot of water. Molds can grow on as little as 16% water. If you dehydrate things, you'll find that if you don't get them very well dehydrated, they can still mold as well. With lyophilization, this is how we would actually purchase commercial samples of microbes. This combines freezing and drying. These can be preserved for years. They instantly freeze them in liquid nitrogen and or dry ice and then vacuum the water out. It uses sublimation to remove the water and this prevents the formation of the large damaging ice crystals. High pressure can be used. This can be applied to liquid suspensions. It alters the molecular structures of the proteins and carbohydrates. Endospores tend to be pretty resistant to this, but it's been used in Japan and the U.S. to preserve fruit juices. With osmotic pressure, you would use high concentrations of salt or sugar in food. This is what's used in like jams and jellies. You're not putting the sugar in there to sweeten it. You're actually putting the sugar in to preserve them. So the low sugar recipes do not last very long because they're not going to be as damaging to the osmotic pressure. Filtration will trap microbes that are larger than the pores in the filter. You can use membrane filters made of nitrocellulose or plastic. These will have a pore size from 25 microns down to less than 0.01 micron. The smallest ones can now filter viruses. They are not necessarily readily available. If you're looking at a water filter for, say, backpacking, most of those are not going to filter viruses. The ones that do, they've had trouble being able to have them be very reliable. Prions can pass through the 0.01 microns. HEPA filters, your high efficiency particulate air filters, are going to be used in medical environments and biological safety cabinets with certain microbes. Radiation will also destroy some microbes. The shorter wavelength radiation in your electromagnetic spectrum is going to be more suitable. The shorter the wavelength, the higher the energy, so they're going to be better penetrating. Ionizing radiation is going to be the shortest wavelength, the higher energy. With here, you're going to use the electron beams in your gamma rays or x-rays. They're going to be shorter than one nanometer wavelength. They're going to have enough energy to disrupt hydrogen bonding, oxidize double bonds, form reactive hydroxyl groups, and have enough energy to eject the electrons from the matter. These can be used on lab equipment, but they don't do deep penetration into matter. They can be used on thin foods. Just because a food has been sterilized with ionizing radiation does not make the food radioactive. With non-ionizing radiation, the wavelengths are greater than 1 nanometer. UV light falls into this category. Visible light, infrared, and radio are also non-ionizing radiation, but they don't have enough energy to be useful. Only UV has enough energy to be useful. It does not penetrate well, so it's only used for transparent fluid air or on surfaces. There's not enough energy to force the electrons out of their orbits. Microwaves, these do not have much direct effect on microbes. The moist heat will kill some of the organisms, but they don't heat things evenly and it doesn't get hot enough to kill. It will heat the water up to boiling and that's all the hotter it will get. A lot of times people will see things on YouTube or things will get passed around on social media that you can throw your sponges, your kitchen sponges in the microwave or the dishwasher and to sterilize them. This will not sterilize them. It's only going to get at maximum up to boiling which does not kill everything. There have been a lot of outbreaks from people using a microwave to cook pork. It will look cooked, but it will not get high enough temperature to destroy everything. Chemicals can be used to control microbes. Phenol is going to denature proteins. It disrupts the cell membranes. These 
compounds are going to be intermediate to low level. They've been used in home and healthcare settings, things like Lysol. If you're familiar with Lysol, you're aware it has a very bad odor. That is one of the downsides, and they may irritate the skin. You can add other functional groups or reactive atoms to phenol compounds to make your chlorinated phenols. It will enhance the antimicrobial action and actually make the odor a little less annoying. Some of your natural oils, like pine and clove oil, are going to actually have phenol in them. Bisphenols are derivatives of the phenols. With those, you have two phenolic groups bridged together. The biguanides, these tend to have broad spectrum activity. They affect the bacterial cell membrane, especially in the gram positives. They will also affect gram negatives, except the pseudomonads. Pseudomonads are really difficult to eliminate. It's not sporicidal, but it is effective on the envelope viruses. Some examples are chlorhexidine and alexidine that's used in surgical hand scrubs. Alcohols are considered an intermediate level agent. They are not effective against fungal or bacterial spores. Alcohols are going to need to have some water in them. Isopropyl and ethanol denature proteins and disrupt cytoplasmic membranes. Because they need some water, you'll tend to use them as 70 to 90 percent alcohol. Tinctures of antimicrobial agents in alcohol are often more effective than the same chemical in water. Alcohols used in hand sanitizers. Rarely is the hand sanitizer going to actually reach the claimed 99.9 .9 effectiveness in a typical user. So most users will not use enough. They will not scrub long enough. They're just not as effective as they claim to be. Things like Clostridium difficile or C. diff and your unenveloped viruses are relatively resistant. So hand sanitizers are not going to be adequate if you're dealing with those things. The acid anionic sanitizers are used in food processing. With these, the anion reacts with the plasma membrane. These can act on a wide spectrum of substances and organisms. They're fast acting, odorless, non toxic, and non corrosive. Your halogens, this is things like iodine, chlorine, bromine, and fluorine, they're considered intermediate level. They will denature and oxidize enzymes. They're effective against fungal spores, some bacterial spores, and protozoan cysts. Iodine has been used as an antiseptic. You have chlorine and bleach as sodium hypochlorite, bromine in hot tubs. Your hypochlorous acid solution is germicidal. It's used as an iodophore and betadine. Chlorines in drinking water, chlorine dioxide gas can be used to disinfect large spaces. Fluorine will actually disrupt the biofilms of dental plaque a little bit as well. That's not the primary purpose of fluorine in dental treatments, but it is kind of a side effect of it. Oxidizing agents, these would be things like peroxides, ozone, peracetic acid. These will oxidize enzymes. They're considered high level. They're good for inanimate objects. They're not good for wounds because human cells have catalase that will neutralize it. You'll also actually have some collateral damage of the human cells in the area. Ozone works well for drinking water, per acetic acid for surfaces. Ozone's a little more effective, but it is more expensive. Your peroxygens are, the, are a group of oxidizing agents. Again, not good for wounds, but good for inanimate objects. You can use heated hydrogen peroxide gas to sterilize atmospheres and surfaces, such as hospital rooms. Peroxygens also include ozone, benzoyl peroxide, and peracetic acid. The surfactants, these decrease the surface tension of water. These are your soaps and detergents. They're good degermining agents because they help to loosen microbes from the surface of the skin so they can be rinsed off, but they are not antimicrobial themselves. The detergents are positively charged surfactants that are going to help to loosen things, and they are antimicrobial. So just some interesting side notes on there. Antibacterial hand soaps really are not necessary in most situations. So with the soap being a degerming agent, it really isn't important for it to be antimicrobial. Usually you would use other substances if you're really wanting that antimicrobial activity. Quaternary ammonia compounds, these are used in industrial and medical applications because they're harmless to humans. 
This is what's in mouthwash. It helps to disrupt cellular membranes. But pseudomonas can grow in it, so it's considered a low level. If somebody is going to use mouthwash and they take it directly out of the bottle, there is probably pseudomonas growing in that mouthwash before too long. It's not effective against non-envelope viruses or the mycobacterium or endospores. It's deactivated by soaps. Some examples include the benzalkonium chloride. This is what's in the little wipes that a lot of times you're given to use if you need to do a clean catch of urine. And acetylperidium, and acetylperidium chloride is ansepical. The heavy metals, these are things like arsenic, arsenic, zinc, mercury, silver, copper. These combine with the sulfur and cysteine, and that will alter the 3D shape of the protein. Silver nitrate was used in newborn eyes for dyseria, gonorrhea, blindness. That's now been replaced with antibiotics. Thimerosal contains mercury. This was used to preserve vaccines. In 1999, they discouraged the use of it. All of the recommended child vaccines are now thimerosal free except the flu. A few adult vaccines still contain it, such as the flu, meningococcal meningitis, whole cell pertussis, and tetanus. Copper, this will interfere with the chlorophyll. It's used in algae control. Copper, zinc, and mercury are used to control mildew and paint. Silver infused fibers have actually been used in clothing to minimize odors. You tend to see that with athletic clothing where they will talk about that you can wear it more than once and it will inhibit the bacterial growth that causes the odors. Aldehydes, these include formaldehyde and glutaraldehyde. They will cross-link aminos, amino groups, hydroxyl, sulfhydryl, and carboxyl groups. 2% glutaraldehyde can be used to disinfect mental and medical and dental equipment. 37% formaldehyde is used in formalin. This is used for embalming and disinfecting inanimate objects. Formal, formaldehyde and formalin are carcinogenic, so they do have to be handled with some caution. Gases like ethylene oxide, propylene oxide, beta propiolactone, these can be used to sterilize objects that can't be exposed to heat or chemicals. They'll denature proteins and DNA. The downside to these is they are potential, potential carcinogens and very poisonous. So we do have some antimicrobial enzymes that will act against microbes. So lysozyme, which is present in our tears, will actually digest peptidoglycan and then that will disrupt the osmotic pressure of the organism causing it to die. These are used in the food industry in cheese and wine. There's actually a prion enzyme that can be used to target prions now that was approved for use in the European Union in 2006. So chemical preservatives have been used in food for a long time. Sulfur dioxide has been used in wine making. Sodium benzoic, sorbic acid, calcium propionate, these are used to prevent molds. Sodium nitrate and sodium nitrite have been used in meat. The nitrate is used as a substitute for oxygen in anaerobic conditions. This will prevent the germination of the botulism spores. It also inhibits iron-containing enzymes of the Clostridium botulinum, which is the organism causing botulism. Another technique is plasma sterilization. This can be used to sterilize tubes that have very narrow diameters. These are used a lot of times in the medical field. They're placed in a vacuum with an electromagnetic field and a chemical like hydrogen peroxide to form a plasma. The plasma will have free radicals to destroy the microbes. This is relatively expensive, but it is necessary for some of the medical equipment. Supercritical fluids have been used. Something like carbon dioxide is compressed into its supercritical state. When it's in that state, it has properties of both a liquid and a gas. This will target most organisms in their vegetative states, and even endospores only require a temperature of 45 degrees Celsius like this. Other antimicrobials, these are going to include your antibiotics, semi-synthetics, and synthetics. Some antibiotics have considerable use in food preservation and are not used therapeutically in humans. This would be things like nissen and cheese to help inhibit the endospores forming bacteria that spoil the food. Natamycin is an antifungal agent used in cheese. 
So in another lecture, we will talk about antimicrobials used in humans.